Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Exploring the unexplained. Breaking down barriers. Putting the macabre under the microscope. Dissecting the disturbing. Seeking out the sinister. Bringing you the jinkies and the jump scares. Hey guys, welcome back to Freaky Friday. Today, as considering I think we've had a fair amount of paranormal uh, events and phenomena happen around us and we've actively gone out and sought it. So, I mean, we were just discussing this now. I guess in a way we uh, see ourselves as paranormal investigators. Yeah. And a very relevant and recent topic was the passing of one of the, I think, most well-known paranormal investigators out in the world and that was Lorraine Warren and I know the Warrens have had such a massive impact on the paranormal world, world exactly <laughs> yeah. just yeah you know, the the amount of cases they've dealt with the amount of like infamous cases they've dealt with so many of them have been turned into films yeah um and, and I think that's the thing. You don't have to be a paranormal investigator to have come into contact with the Warrens' work at some point if you're, you know, into the paranormal or horror because they've inspired so many horror movie franchises, books, um, the list goes on. So I think if you are at all interested in the paranormal, you have heard of the Warrens at some point. Yeah, they are quite an infamous lot <laughs> in the... <laughs> paranormal world famous or infamous depending on how you look at it it's sort of true thing. there is a lot of controversy around the topic but nonetheless they have they've had some groundbreaking events and um cases and i think i think in a lot of ways they paved the way for paranormal investigation i really really do think they did that yeah so also we've also had the recent passing of lorraine warren um so I think it's almost a nice way to honor her is to talk about her work in the paranormal field. Her and Ed's. Yeah. I mean, Ed did, Ed passed quite a few years quite ago. Quite a few years ago, exactly. Um, but it, it felt very, almost like final with Lorraine's passing. It was exactly. like, you know... That, these, that was the modern. <laughs> yeah, the two most prominent, well, in my opinion, two of the most prominent figures in the paranormal world are, you know, gone. And all we have left are their stories. And I mean... They have so many stories. Some exactly. Of, some of the most famous cases, famous paranormal cases. Of hauntings and demonic uh, possessions of the 20th century. Yeah. Things that led up until recently. I mean, I know the first one that I knew about was um, the Snedeker family, which inspired the movie The Haunting in Connecticut. That was the first time I sort of heard anything about the Warrens. Uh, I think I started to become more aware of them through Annabelle, mm. the fact that they took on Annabelle. Again, that inspired, what, two or three movies now? Yeah, it's two or three f movies. They've also, they were inspiration behind The Conjuring, which is obviously Annabelle's a spin-off of. Um, they were the main people on the ground for the Amityville horror that took place. And that's honestly, I think, one of the most controversial cases Definitely out there. Definitely is of, you know, something paranormal being the cause of something much greater and, you know, more terrifying. But yeah, they've definitely owned the title some of the most famous cases of hauntings and cases out there to this date. And I think another another big point around the two of them is that, you know, they're, they're met with a lot of skepticism. They definitely are. That is something I encountered a lot. They are... A lot of people for them, a lot of people who said they've done some great work, um, full, they full, fully support them behind them. Others who, in very harsh words, mm -hmm. say they maybe preyed a bit on people who, who were in very distressful situations and really needing help. Yeah, no, well, I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, it's too... It's two vastly different opinions on them. You have people, like you said, who support them 100%. They're very prolific in the paranormal world. But then on the other side of things, people think that they're the biggest bunch of frauds. And I, I, I personally feel like that's a bit harsh. I also do. I mean, I, I do think there are times, as 
any paranormal investigator where you can get carried away and you know, explain something that's perfectly logical and explain it as being paranormal when it isn't. Um, I think we're all susceptible to that. And also being caught up in so many intense cases with some of the most like in, insane and incredible phenomena happening around them. I'm sure more and more like the impossible must just become like, OK, this can happen. So yeah, and I mean, it becomes more plausible for them. Yeah, but also, and then on the other hand, you know, I have ne- I've never met them. I don't know them personally, but from what I've read about them and heard about them is they seem like really genuine people who wanted to help and it wasn't about making a buck, you know? That's what that's the impression I got. And funny enough, people would say, if you were to see the two of them on the street, you would never, ever guess that they were paranormal investigators. Mm. They were such normal um kind people and just uh, yeah they uh, that they didn't come off i mean for the things they've dealt with Mm. they don't reflect it at all yeah and i mean um as far as what i've researched they didn't charge anyone they did not that's i also came across that they never charge anybody for anything they did even when they were called out to cases all over the only thing they did was ask for the costs of like say obviously travel or whatever mm. they needed to spend money on be yeah. covered but they are never charged for profit or anything yeah like well that. i mean you look at the the case that the uh, second conjuring film was based on they went to england to take on this case and uh, i mean obviously you want your travel costs covered but they never uh, charged. i think that's reasonable yeah they never charged for their services though and i think that's admirable and i think that lends itself to you know it just speaks a lot to their character yeah and it it for me tells me that they weren't frauds i mean i do know that they made money off of selling their stories which but is fair though I- exactly if you are spending all of your time dedicating it to this you need to have some form of income why not loop the two together well i mean i know for me if someone were to approach me and say you know i want to make a movie off of the story of this experience that happened to you, I would want some of the profits from that. I think that's natural. Exactly. Um, but So yeah, I, if you were to ask my opinion, I do think that maybe sometimes the they warrants got carried, away. got carried away, but I by no means think that they were frauds. No, I, I agree with you completely on that opinion. Uh, and funny enough, I mean, I believe also they, they came from very normal backgrounds and uh, Ed was self-taught and self-professed demonologist, yeah, um, as well as an author and a lecturer. Mm. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, both of the Warrens were lecturers. I believe so. Yeah, and I think they charged for that as well, which is normal that's if that's exactly, your job. That's a, that's you your know. job. Um, and I know Lorraine professed to be a clairvoyant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to talk a bit about how they met, because I think that is just the cutest story. I think we story. should start at the beginning. Exactly. And it goes a lot to also speaking about building up the image of the people we are talking about through the soul. And showing that they were normal. Exactly. Normal people with normal stories, and, you know. Um, but just, you know, going to what I researched, I believe they met when they were 16. They did. Yeah, so they were like childhood sweethearts. <laughs> so cute. Yeah, uh, Ed was working at a theater. As an usher, yeah. Exactly, and Lorraine and her mother would visit their theater quite often, and the two of them got to know each other through that. They became friends until Ed eventually worked up the courage and asked her out on a date, and from there things just soared. Yeah, I believe they started dating. He went off to fight in the war. Yes. And uh, when he was back on leave, they got married. Exactly. I think about 1945? Around that time. I might be wrong. Don't (laughs) quote me on that. (laughs) But that's, to me, that's like your typical sweet story of like how your grandparents met. Exactly. It's such a simple but sweet story. That's what I love about it. And I mean, okay, I haven't seen a lot of uh, media of the two of them, um, but I've obviously seen the Conjuring films, if you're a horror buff, you've seen them, <laughs> and just seeing the way that Vera Farmiga and Patrick Wilson interact as those characters is just so heartwarming and so sweet, and I know that they, I know that Vera Farmiga especially spent a lot of time with Lorraine to get um, that character to get into and that bring character. it across. Yeah. yeah. So I know uh, that Ed personally, the way he got into all the paranormal side of uh, things is that he had a 
experience as a child. And his father was a police officer, and through all these things that would happen to him as a child, his father would say, anything that happens in this house can be explained by something logical. Mm. Uh, and apparently the event that would occur was around 2 or 3 a.m. every morning, he would hear his closet door opening. Mm. And when looking in the closet, he would see at first just a shapeless darkness, and it would eventually sort of start forming into, a, a bit of light would start forming, and that would form into a ball, mm. which he called a ghost globule. Um, and it was this big ball of white light. Mm. And he said the longer he looked at that, he started to see the face of a woman, mm. an old woman, in that ball, and that she did not look pleasant. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he said that he tried, but there was no way he could logically explain that, and he spent the rest of the nights uh, between his parents in the hair room. Oh, wow. So I think that's what set off his um, interest and that's always, that's, fascination. Yeah, that's always something that I enjoy, you know, finding out about and listening to, is stories of how paranormal investigators started out, like what their trigger was, you know? It just takes one experience, one event, and... And it can either deter you completely, where you want to sort of stay away from it and shove, shove it, it away, off, yeah. or you can start investigating, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, so do I. But I want to dive into some of their most famous cases, because like it's, like we've been saying, you know, it inspired a lot of movies. Well, shouldn't we just first cover how they actually got their foot in oh, the yeah, door to get to those points? Of course, yeah. Because as we said, they started off pretty much as nobody, so it's not like they could... Uh, I'm guessing once they built up their title, it was quite something to have Ed and Lorraine Warren mm. around you, and of course you would let them in, and you you have the idea they know what they're doing. But Once they were a household out. name, exactly. Yeah. It didn't start out like that, and apparently the way they got through, uh, got into the whole thing was uh, they started out by selling paintings, mm. and they actually had a pretty good life from that. Mm. And Ed was the main artist. Yes, yeah, Ed yeah. loved painting, and he. Every time he would hear about any sort of paranormal location that was haunted or um, any kind of paranormal event, he would drag Lorraine with him, mm. um, reminding her each time of the event that had happened in his childhood to persuade her to come with. Mm. And they worked as a team. And also, I love this. It's very cute to me how mm. they worked. And he would purposefully stand outside in the street where the family would be able to see him and paint the house with a spirit coming out of it mm. um, and like I said make sure that the family could see he's doing this and from there Lorraine would take over and with her like bubbling personality would take the painting he painted walk up to the door saying my husband uh, is absolutely um, obsessed with ghost hauntings and he painted this picture of, this, of your house and he would like to give it to you. And that would open up the to like uh, the door. They would get the foot in there. They would start a conversation with the people and that's how they began their investigations. It's weird because when I was doing my research, um, what I heard was that he would just paint the house and then take it to them and just be like, oh, hey, I, you know, I painted your house. It's a lovely house. And they'd say, would you like a tour? And that's how they'd get in and tour the house and then start talking about the... Um, the history and stuff like that. So and I think slowly then through that they would have built up their reputation but by bit. Yeah. And I mean it took what like one really big case and they were pretty much a household name at least in the paranormal world. Exactly. And then they started their own society. Yeah. Abbreviated to NESPA? Yeah and I believe that stands for the New England Society for Psychic Research. Research yeah. And what's interesting about that was um that the society is made up of so many different kinds of individuals from medical doctors to researchers to scientists to nurses mm. and doctors and police officers and the main aim was because of Ed's belief system where he said out and out he's a skeptic mm. he said he needs to see something he needs to feel something he needs to hear something before he will believe it yeah and so with whatever case they were experiencing he would get as many, he would approach it from as many different viewpoints as possible from a scientific point of view, mm. from a theological point of view. Which um, is really important as an investigator. I it really is. So I thought that was actually quite profound that mm. 
even though he'd had his experience as a child, he went in as a skeptic and it had to be proved to him. Yeah. Um, I know he, he apparently would take, with each investigation, he would take three or four mediums into the location, not mm. tell them where they are, not tell them what the case was. Mm. And if they would all come back with the same thing, then he knew he was on the right path. That's interesting because Lorraine was a medium, as far as I know. Exactly. So it's that's interesting to me. So I wonder if she would be brought in first, give her view on things and then see if other people picked up on it or if it was the other way around. Mm, that is actually a very interesting point of view. But also you can see how the two fit together. That's the thing. I think that it also it makes them such a perfect couple. It does. It really, like, really does. You know, like couple goals. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you got the psychic medium and a demonologist getting together and just making this their life. And that, I think that's another reason that they're so admirable and prolific in the paranormal world is that they, you know, they were just like this duo that had everything. Exactly. And they dedicated their life to it. They really did. Yeah. Uh, I can remember reading something in one article where he, it actually, uh, Ed and Lorraine said, um, it started out about being curious and wanting to get into just the whole um, investigation and exploring the paranormal until a case where they were brought into a location that was supposedly haunted only to actually communicate with a little girl, oh, apparently wow. a seven-year-old little girl, who was just looking for her mother. Oh, no. And that broke their hearts because they're like, there's this child who's trapped here. Mm. She's looking for her mom. Um, and all he wanted to do was help. Mm. And from that day forward, that's sort of what their work and their society became about. They wanted to help people. Mm. They wanted to help entities. Yeah. Um, so I think that became the main aim of their... I, I don't know when that happened to them, but I do know that they also had a daughter of their own. Um, so I can just imagine if they had yeah, a daughter at that exactly. point. Exactly. That must have affected them quite badly. Um, and that actually leads me into what I believe is probably one of their most famous cases, which is the case of the Perrin family, and it was actually what inspired the first Conjuring film. Yeah, uh, um, that was quite a hectic case. I think I think it happened in Harrisville, Rhode Island. And there were children involved in that, no? Yeah, they definitely yeah. were. Um, so it's believed that the Perrin home was um, haunted by a witch, mm. and the witch's name... She lived in the, in the early 19th century, I believe, and her name was but Sheba Sherman, I might be messing that name up, but it's along those lines. And she had a, uh, the land was uh, believed to be cursed, Mm. that whoever lived there would die a horrible death. And what ended up happening was she had, I believe, four children, Mm. and three of them died young. Okay. And the deaths raised suspicion in the town, and everyone blamed her for it. And um, so I think they sort of blamed her that she was a Satanist Mm. and the community turned on her. And what she did was she hung herself out in the backyard. Yeah, I remember I I watched the the actual movie The Conjuring such a long time ago, but I do remember that being part of it where she hung herself from a tree in the yard. Just, yeah. Um, And I think uh, Lorraine actually picked up on that. Yes, I think she did. And... After that, the parent family moved in, mm. and they started in, like experiencing a lot of um, ghostly interactions, but not negative. They said they, um, the interactions were spirits playing with their children, spirits mm. actually helping out with the chores. Oh wow! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can I, I get one of those? <laughs> I was like, okay, I've never heard of that before, but okay. Um, but then there were also the darker interactions, which started to come through. Um, and also a menacing presence was suddenly suddenly started to settle into the household and they would start hearing disembodied voices furniture would start moving um there were full spectral appearances oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> hard pass um and i think i think the woman's name the mother's name was uh caroline if i'm not mistaken and she was actually one of the main victims mm. of the um, menacing presence. And yeah. she would get pinched and slapped a lot. And I think it stems from the fact that she had such healthy um, children and she was a 
she had the role of mother and loving wife. Yeah. And that um, is what the entity always wanted. Exactly. Because yeah. I, I believe that everyone assumed the entity was Bathsheba. Yeah. I don't know how true to reality it was, but I remember in the film, um, the mother waking up with bruises all yes. over her body. So like I said, she, she was the main victim. And I don't know how true this is, but I read that... Um, her husband hmm. was a victim, but in a sexual way. The, oh, the medicine really? person would, uh, like, you know, try and sort of almost claim him it's for like herself. A succubus type. Vibe. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly <laughs> what I actually thought. Creepy man. Um, and yeah, when when things escalated, I know the war- warrants were brought in mm. to help investigate that, but their presence there actually aggravated to such an intense level that they were asked to leave. Oh, really? That's I didn't actually I know that. Oh, uh, that's what I believe. Okay, so that's where it differs from the film because I know in the film, um, Ed and Lorraine seem to be the, the, the driving heroes, force behind yes, yes. closing the case all. So that's not the sense I got from my research. However, mm. that, as I said, with all this stuff, there's so many different versions yeah. of any story. Yeah, it's interesting. But um, like I said earlier, I think I one of my favorite was um, what The Haunting in Connecticut was based off of, which was the Snedeker family. Um, and there's a lot of controversy around that as well, is that a lot of people said that, you know, the Snedeker family wasn't reliable because there was talk of drug use and alcoholism and stuff like that. But to this day, it's still like, I'd, I'm going off of the film because I haven't done a lot of research into the actual case because it's so um, surrounded by controversy. Mm. Um, but I remember watching that film and just being super freaked out by it and what had gone on but I have also heard that it's very different from the chain of events that actually did happen Happen. Mm. yeah um I think the one that affected me the most one of the case that of theirs that affected me the most was Annabelle (laughs) the fact that they would take that door on and into their own museum well yeah that's another thing is they had a museum of filled with objects that cursed objects that they'd investigated or that had been given to them exactly and I, I always believed that it was in their house, but I heard that it's actually across the street from them. I, I don't know how anybody would be able to live a normal life with all of that in their house. Yeah. To no. me, it makes more sense that it's across the street. Yeah, prob- probably. <laughs> then again, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what gave me the idea that it was in their house. I, don't I, I think at one stage I did believe that as well. Yeah, but I did read that it was across the road or very close to their house. And they didn't... I, I do believe they give tours around the museum. Yes, um, I've heard. But I also believe that they, you know, started collecting these objects and putting them in one room as a way to get them sort of out of the... out of other people's... Home. Homes. Exactly, which also speaks to, like I said, it's their character. I mean, the, for, I think that's why Annabelle stands out so much for me. It's the fact that the extent of malevolence around that doll and the entity attached to it was so severe, and yet they still took that on to take it away from, I believe it was a nurse and her roommate. I know Annabelle changed hands a couple of times. A couple of times, each with devastating effects to the owners. Yeah. Um, and they stepped in and took on that responsibility knowing the effects that every other owner had had. Hmm. So to me, the fact that uh, it speaks to the sense that they just were trying to help. Yeah, but then you also, you do get people that argue that they're, you know, they were making money off of the tours. And, it is true. But I know that they they very heavily um, not guarded but protected that house or the museum um, so that nothing could get out um, and affect people again and I yeah I think that's admirable I really do I believe the case that affected Lorraine Warren the most was Amityville oh, really? she actually even stated she said she would never go in there again she said Amityville was horrible she would never step foot inside that house well I know I mean there's Again, so much uh, controversy around Amityville and what went on there, but yeah, that one's another freaky one. Yeah, they they dealt with some very hectic things in their time, even some very ob cases, like werewolves, and I think they experienced a lot in their time, and to be honest, I'm 
almost impressed they lasted as long as they did with the kind of things they surrounded themselves with. Yeah, whether whether you want to call them frauds or not, I think they dealt with a lot. And I think I I look up to them as a paranormal investigator. As I'm, do I. I'm very appreciative of their con- uh, their contributions to the paranormal world. I think they've left behind a lot for all yeah. paranormal investigators today. The, I believe their society, the Nesper Society, is still running strong. I believe so, yeah. So... The impact was definitely noted and worth mentioning. Yeah, whatever you believe about them, they're still, you know, very... Groundbreaking. Very, yeah, they re- like I said earlier, they paved the way for other paranormal investigators, and I'm super thankful to both of them. As am I. And yeah, just all respects to the recently passed Lorraine Wire. Yeah, but... Uh, Hopefully this episode was informative. I hope you guys learned a bit more about both Ed and, and Lorraine. And uh, yeah, do some do some of your own research. You know, find out more about their cases. There are tons. They're full of amazing information that we can't cover in one episode. No, there is so much. It will definitely keep you busy. But yeah, thanks for joining us. And we will catch you next time. Where we will be speaking about Dia de los Muertos or Day of the Dead. Freaky Fridays, hosted by Devin Beatty and Megan Portnoy, and produced with the generous assistance of Yanu Blau and Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Audio.